Good morning, Hokies, and welcome to Preparing for the College Classroom. Um, my name is Kim Filer. I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning at Virginia Tech, and I have the privilege of working with amazing faculty all over campus um, in, on what they're working on in the classroom, their pedagogical approaches, as well as preparing for the fall. Uh, today, what you're going to do is you're going to really hear a lecture from one of our chemistry professors, and you're going to really get an aspect of simulating what it's going to be like to be in a large class in your first semester. And in addition to that, you're going to get some helpful hints along the way about being successful your first semester as you come back to Blacksburg for your August time with us. Um, so let me introduce your speaker for today. This is Janine Edelton. She is a professor of chemistry. She actually came to Virginia Tech as a student in 1982. She finished her BS in chemistry in 86, followed by a master's in chemistry as well as a PhD in teaching and learning. She's been working at Tech pretty much off and on ever since, and we are so happy she's here. She is a SPORN award winner. So this is a teaching award that's nominated by students, presented by students, and evaluated by students. She is one of our superstars, and she is here to share with you her knowledge of chemistry as well as some of her advice for you to be successful in the fall. So welcome, Janine. Thank you, Kim. So welcome, uh, incoming Hokies, and their parents and siblings, whomever else might be listening in right now. Uh, as Kim said, I'm Janine Edelton. I'm a senior instructor in chemistry, as you can see on my first slide here. And uh, I had to make fun of the mock lecture name. Like, what do, are we mocking the lecture? Or is it a mock-up of a real lecture? And what, what does that mean? I couldn't, I, I intended to incorporate my summer school lecture and my class with me this morning morning via Zoom, but the, um, the streaming isn't, they're not playing well. All of our AV stuff isn't playing well with that this morning. So I'm not going to be able to do that, but um, I can talk for, an, for days, for days without sto uh, stopping talking about chemistry. I'm going to point out behind me the periodic table in our chemistry classroom. We have the periodic table on the wall, and when I was asked to do this, I said, I need a periodic table on the wall. So I can pound on it and drive home some points that are both chemistry and about other stuff. I'll point out right now that when I got here in 1982, I had the audacity to think I was going to major in engineering. I was uh, ill prepared both academically and culturally for that experience. At the end of my freshman experience and many tear-filled phone calls with my parents later, I changed my major to chemistry and some people say, you mean you changed from engineering to chemistry and life got better? And I said, yes. And then on my 35th uh, service reception, here's me with Tim Sands because I'm bad at the phone thing because I'm like your parents, I'm a mom, I, I finger text you know, with my index finger. And I was like, hey, Timmy Sands, you take the selfie. You're good at this stuff. And um, in my opinion, you guys are entering at a time when we have a visionary leading our university. And it's my pleasure to be a part of the, uh, not just the welcoming, but of the entirety of what that means for you coming in. Um, get ready to Zoom in class, folks. Get ready to Zoom. Zoom is amazing. And more on that in a minute. So this is my baker's brownie recipe. Chemistry is something that people fear and they say even to your child's pediatrician when you meet them. Oh, what do you do? Well, I teach chemistry. Oh my goodness, that was my worst class I ever took, my most feared class I ever took, the lowest grade I ever got in a college, uh, in a college classroom. And I say that's because it wasn't taught very well. I think. In any case, I always start by talking about stoichiometry with this brownie recipe and I post it to Canvas so that everybody's got my brownie recipe and I always say, you know what, so I parent, I parent young adults at this point. 
I go into the refrigerator to get eggs to make brownies. I open up the carton. How many eggs are in there? Five? No, never. Full dozen? No, never. Maybe two, maybe one. Um, and nobody's told me that we're low. Can I make brownies? Can I make brownies with two eggs? Sure I can. Can I make a full batch of brownies with two eggs? No, I can't. I can make two-fifths of a batch of brownies, right? You know that from looking at this recipe card. You just did stoichiometry and you didn't even realize it, okay? Because stoichiometry is recipe. It's not a perfect analogy for those of you who are, you know, experts in the field out there watching this stream. Um, it's not a perfect analogy. I can mess up a little bit here, like maybe I put three and a half cups of sugar or maybe two and three quarter cups of sugar. Can I still make brownies? Yeah, but they're not gonna be the perfect recipe brownies. All right, so idle exercises, no. In fact, I point out to my engineers all the time as I'm doing this summer that the manipulation of materials and the manufacture of final products that are also materials is a constant negotiation in purchasing resources to make stuff, whether it's brownies or whether it's something bigger than that. So wrapped up in this discussion of bringing chemistry and materials and elements together in reactions and products, recipe or, you know, brownies, is a lot of effort. And so the way I teach in my classes, I do use PowerPoint, but for the most part, I show pictures and I tell stories. And then you, the student, are in the lecture hall busily taking down the other stuff. And when my students say, well, I need to miss class, or I wasn't in class last time, on my syllabus, says, hey, don't get lecture notes from me. Get them from the people in the class that captured what happened and that's who you get your notes from. Okay, now that has changed. And Zoom has really ramped up what we're capable of capturing and then storing for later viewing. Okay, so that's either the most amazing thing ever. I'm thrilled to have learned how to do this. I think it has improved my teaching practice. I think it has improved accessibility for students I think all sorts of good things about the innovations that we instructors have had to develop in response to our new remote delivery of instruction. Lest you think entering now you're getting less. I beg to differ, I think you're getting more. So what an amazing construct is American public education. So this picture here, the driver is the guy in the, in the straw brimmed hat. That was my husband's great-grandfather. One of the little guys next to him is his grandfather, his grandfather's older brother, and this is the bus they took to school. Rodell drove it. This is the bus they took to school around Lakewood, Ohio in 1927. So there's nothing more inspiring in my mind than seeing the school buses. I live on the street the same street that the Montgomery County Public Schools bus corral lives on. And each day I watch parades of school buses back and forth. We don't care where you live. We're gonna bring you to public education. Lest any of you be undereducated about American public education, however, it was developed to socialize, not to academically educate the populace, okay? It was a factory model. So we've had to change a little bit, but how much effort are you willing to put forth to get to class? Are you willing on a bleak, gray, precipitously awful morning to exit your dorm and go to class anyway? Are you willing to do that? Now, this is my then eight-year-old son going down, camp, going down the front steps his little sister watching, waiting for her turn. And, you know, did he want to be out there riding the bus to school? Uh, well, no, not really, but off you go. How hard are you willing to work to get to class? And then, 
I'll show you my pictures are all over the place. So this is an artifact from my childhood. My dad brought home from work stacks of cardstock with these letters printed and I always ask my, uh, in the first few lectures of the semester, I ask my class to tell me what do not hump means. And there is no greater delight than an old person gets from being in a classroom full of impressionable young people and making them exceedingly uncomfortable. It's what I am, I'm so good at doing that you just wouldn't believe it. Like, no fear, because I've been there, done that, nothing to lose, everything to gain from my students. What does this mean? Well, I'll tell you, since we don't have people in the audience, do we have anybody listening in who might be able to tell me what that means? There are many, there are many possible interpretations. Nothing coming in right now. That's okay. That's okay. So, why would my dad bring home stacks of these things? Well, one of my students once said, do you know what? It was a misprint. It, it should have said, do not jump. But there was a typo, and he brought home all the wasted misprinted. I said, I never thought of that. I never thought of that. No, he brought them home because they just had copious quantities of things. What is do not hump? My dad worked in a brickyard in Baltimore, Maryland. They made fire brick for the interior of steel furnaces for the steel industry back when we used to manufacture steel domestically. Do not hump was put on all of the rail cars. Smacking them on there when they came in, you don't want to hump together rail cars. There are maritime definitions as well. You don't want to hump together waterborne vessels because you're going to damage them. So this was a caution to slow down and take care and don't ram the couplings together. Okay? And me and my sisters drew and, and did childhood homemade art on do not hump pictures. Right? We all have relics of them in our, you know, keep forever boxes uh, at home. So, but this makes all of my students clearly uncomfortable and they're all giggling. They're like, does she, does she know? Does she understand? Like some of the other possible connotations of this? Of course I do. But do you remember talking about this in your chemistry class? Yes, you do. My point being is that the definitions of things are contextual. And unless you have the context or have the context demonstrated to you, you, you should make no assumptions. Don't make any assumptions ever. Now. Woo, that's harsh advice because we do well to make assumptions at a certain level to further our just getting through the day, right? We have to make some assumptions, but you need to be careful and you need to be aware when you're making assumptions. Anyway, that's one of the things I teach my students. And then, of course, chemistry is all about definitions, all about definitions. I always tell my students, too, this is a small town. It's a small world. Behave yourselves at all times. Okay? I will run into you Saturday afternoon in Lowe's in Christiansburg. I am blindly, not looking up, checking out of Lowe's. And the cashier said, are you Janine? And I looked up over my mask through my fogged up glasses. And I said, oh, Cordlin, former advisee, former chemistry major, checking me out at Lowe's. It happens all the time. Behave yourselves. We will see each other at some point in the future. Do you want a letter of recommendation from one of those seemingly anonymous large lecture professors you're going to have when you enter as a Virginia Tech freshman? Then start by establishing relationship with them in a respectful way. Okay? I understand that college students are kind of, it's by design. You're supposed to misbehave a little bit. But rest assured, I will see you. 
I have so many things to say. So this picture, make, what, what do you think? What do you think, this picture? When I showed this to my students, they were like, hmm, looks like an American flag. Hmm, looks like some pretty trees. Guess what? When I snapped this picture, I was trying, I was trying to focus on the dot that's right smack in the middle of its fuzzy. You can't quite tell what it is. And it's a spider. And this is my front porch. And that spider in the middle of that picture had constructed a web that was attached to the flagpole, the pillar on which the flagpole holder is attached, and the flag. And so the next day, when the breeze picked up and the flag started waving, went the spider's web. I see repeatedly students that put themselves in positions similarly. They're used to their parents waking them up in the morning to go to school. And then they come to Virginia Tech. And some of their parents still call them to wake them up in the morning. It happens. But sometimes their, their parent doesn't do that and things kind of fall apart and they don't end up going to class. They put themselves in positions where they are not as fully supported as they've become accustomed to prior to their arrival at college. I understand that this fall is going to be different. Okay, this fall is going to be different. A lot of the instruction might be received by students who are in fact still at home. My summer school kids are all still at home right now. Now, that might be a best case scenario for some folks. That might be a worst case scenario for some folks. It's all over the map. I do know that. But careful as to what supportive structures you construct. Next, this is my pay attention slide. How do you succeed at Virginia Tech? You pay attention to everything. I'll tell you a chemistry relevant story right now. Right now there's about 3,000 Virginia Tech incoming students that are taking Chemistry 1035 in the fall. About 300 of them are going to be in my class. And a couple of weeks ago we opened up the VT Chem Prep. Hey, you have to do this for a couple of reasons. We want you to come in well prepared. We want to give you a structure that you can take advantage of prior to your arrival. And guess what? We're going to offer you 3%, 3% on your final general chemistry grade for having completed it by September 6th or 7th. I'd have to look up the date. Okay? And if you don't do it by the deadline, you don't get 3%. And if you don't finish the whole thing, you don't get the 3% of 100. You get a zero instead. But guess what? Guess what? About 30% of the incoming freshman class has begun that assignment. And I'm willing to bet, I put money on it, I'm willing to bet that half of the remaining people don't even know that there's been a multitude of emails sent out alerting the students that this is an expectation and they haven't yet checked their VT email. And we're in the final week of orientation. So at this point, most of the incoming students should be well aware, but they're not paying attention, okay? And they're not responding to the emails that have been pay attention. This particular slide I took, this is in my backyard, it's now my bank card photo. Go Wells Fargo. I can put a picture on my check card. Who knew? Technology these days. It was pointed out to me by a student. I love this picture. It's pretty. It's the Black Eyed Susans that I transplanted from my parents' backyard in Brooklyn Park in South Baltimore. And they love living there. And one of my students pointed out something that either you've seen or you haven't yet noticed about this picture. 
There's a praying mantis in the picture. Can you see it? There's a praying mantis. It's, a, it's to the right of the period on the slide. And I said to myself, I never noticed that until someone with different eyes looked at my picture and at the time I had it as my desktop background on my computer and prior to class my students had been sitting there listening to music and staring at that picture and they were like oh. there and I said you mean there's a where is there a praying mantis in that picture there's a praying mantis and pay attention pay attention and when I make a mistake in class catch me on it and I will love you forever I love that I love making mistakes in class on my calculator maybe it's a typo or maybe I start out saying something and then have to rethink what I just said pay attention you're gonna catch me in a mistake at some point during my lecture I love when that happens next so another of my tips for success so one of the things I do in my spare time is I am one co-leader although I'm kind of the big leader because I started this thing I have a Girl Scout troop troop 888 Christiansburg Virginia so I'm either your dream of a Girl Scout leader or I'm your worst nightmare so when we were putting together a little dinner we had for our parents and as a thank you to the church where we meet I told my girls we were going to make table decor and they were all excited because some of them know Pinterest and they're like "Woo! what are we gonna do and I sent them outside and I said come up with table decor and they were like yeah well there's nothing out there well there was plenty out there here's what one of our table decor arrangements looked like and when I went to this picture and that's why I love using pictures because you look at this picture and you see one thing and then I tell you a story about it and it possibly changes how you interpret what is right in front of your eyes and that is there is no greater pleasure as a teacher than to have a student look at something re-look at something that they've always assumed means a certain thing and they then look at it with new eyes because they've got more or different experiences learning has happened and they reconceptualize something they've seen over and over and over so this is a bunch of dead stuff that my little girls found out in a field I think it's lovely I did give them some sharpies as you can see one of them wrote welcome on the little scrap of wood take what you've got and turn it into success the table decor for this little banquet here following a church service was stunning and it was all just dead crap that they found outside okay lots of Virginia Tech students come in very well prepared or so they think they've been supported they're motivated they're well intended and then other students come in with less than that but it is my contention that our definition of what well prepared or ill prepared what supported and motivated mean changes for everything changes for everybody in every situation take what you've got and turn it into success next here is my number three son he's the keeper in the orange jersey are you, okay and what has happened and i can we fade my upper right because in this okay so the dude to the immediate right of the goalpost has the ball James has already deflected it okay he's deflected it he's hit the ground and the dude on the right has the ball now and what's he what's he ready to do 
What is he getting ready to do? He's getting ready to shoot again. Okay? But James is already on the ground. Right? He's a big, lanky kind of guy. Fills up the goal. But from the ground, there's only so much you can do. This is my slide I use to tell students that when you're down, which is where you're going to be after the honeymoon period, the first few weeks of freshman year end, and you get your first round of test grades back, homework grades, whatever, are you ready to continue to do battle? Not to use the military analogy necessarily, but are you going to continue to exert the effort necessary to fix what's been damaged or to take the next shot that's coming? Because guess what? Here comes test two. Okay? So can, can you fix damage that gets done early in the semester? Absolutely. Absolutely. Early in the semester, everybody's paying attention. They see this slide, and what they see is, is not, yes, you know what, I've been down before, and that's what I mean about motivating factors and levels of support and experiences that students come in with. You never know and should underestimate at your peril what your peers have already been through and gotten back up and gotten here to Virginia Tech. Okay, what students see when they see that slide, they see, that's not going to happen to me. That's not me. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I'm not going to be the dude on the ground. I'm going to be the dude ready to shoot again. Yeah, that's what you think. But that's not what typically happens. All right, this is my number one son. Um, so the journey happens differently for each and every student. And so my son is a ranger, qualified. He's, this was just the first of his many things that he's done in the US, for the US Army. Uh, but a comment that he made just a few weeks ago when he was home visiting and we were watching President Trump address the graduating class at the US Military Academy at West Point and he said, our president said, you are the best, the brightest. And Andy, my oldest son, said, not true. Because he's in a position of authority at this point in his military service. And he said, good people come from everywhere. My enlisted guys, oh my goodness. My kids that came out of military academies, oh my goodness. There's brilliant stuff coming out of everywhere and the journey happens differently for everybody. So don't assume a success. Don't assume the lack of success, depending on where you're starting from. When that guy went to VMI in the fall of 2010, folks asked me, they said, how's he dealing with the rather Spartan uh, atmosphere at VMI. You sleep on a board on which you unroll this very thin mattress each night. I said, well, I don't know. His mattress at home was on the floor. He doesn't seem to have, no ha have mentioned anything about a lack of comfort or anything. It happens differently for everybody. Some people are well prepared and some of the most adverse, some of the most adverse circumstances have well prepared people for future success. Next, love your neighbor. This is a snapshot I took of my class. I make everybody in my classes meet each other. It's so much fun. Guess what? It happens in Zoom as well. Right now I'm teaching via Zoom with a group I've never met in person and guess what? We are making a go of it. It's fun. I put them in breakout rooms. They talk to each other. So we had to change how we do things, but we are still doing it. And this is, of course, intimately tied up in Virginia Tech's motto of ut prosim, serving each other. All right. Now, I want to get to my balloons here, but I've got plenty of time. Okay, so this is 
the little the girl on my right with the green stripe at the bottom of her shoe those are sketchers that's a rainbow soul on her sketchers this was her first real volleyball experience and she said mom I need volleyball shoes and I said nope that's premature you don't know how to play volleyball yet special equipment is a, going to be of no consequence here I don't know whether you even like this at this point you're a total rookie and you're 11 you don't need volleyball shoes so in her embarrassed state she went out there in her rainbow sketchers that she would bought for the beginning of fifth grade thinking that she would love her rainbow sketchers forever and played some volleyball now there's another point to this picture as well you can probably tell you can make an assumption that something has already happened here and my volleyball players in class look at that and they know exactly what has just happened and some of you watching volleyball fans or players maybe both are looking at that and thinking the ball has just been served how do we know the ball has just been served number 10 didn't flinch she's in the back row does she have a job to do at the serve not really right up at the net is there an immediate job to do is she looking for the ball no no balls just been served how do we know it's already been served what details can you pick up from this picture Emma and Ellie are already in motion if they were in motion prior to the service they would have had a foul called on them they would have been out of position okay they were out of position because right now they're trying to rotate back into position to be where they're supposed to be when the opposing team look at the opposing team where are they looking are they looking at the players on the other side of the net no they are not they're looking at the ball and making a plan every girl out there was a rookie this is the youngest age at which you can play volleyball this was at the uh, Richmond Convention Center a tournament called Monument City and everybody is a rookie at something and you guys coming in as new freshmen are college rookies I don't care how many AP credits you have I don't care how many DE credits you have I don't care if you've been to the community college for two solid years maybe you have served in the military for a couple of years maybe you've been working for a couple of years wherever it is that you've come from if you are brand new to Virginia Tech you are a rookie hokey and I suspect you're gonna learn well how to be a good hokey and it's going to be a blast but you're a rookie and you have a lot to learn a whole lot to learn even if you think you've got it now now I'm going to digress and go to my demonstration that I've brought with me you can't teach a chemistry lecture without doing a demonstration I have forgotten my safety glasses but I'm going to go ahead and do this anyway I hope that the repercussions are mild all right so folks I've got matches I've got a candle I've got a yardstick I've got two balloons and I've got my periodic table now the contents of these two balloons are gases and the particular gases that they are are both in the first period in group one and group eight on the periodic table one of them is hydrogen and the other is helium now hydrogen is an interesting element it belongs in two places on the periodic table in fact sometimes you can find hydrogen located right here above fluorine on the periodic table because hydrogen's electronic structure appropriately puts it in group one where it has one valence electron or in group seven where it is one electron shy of a full valence shell okay so it rightly goes in both places but group eight elements like helium 
They go nowhere else. They're full up. They're done. They've got no interest in further reacting with anything to change their electron configurations. So if I light my match, there's a chemical reaction. Mm, love that. And then I use it to light a candle. Chemical reaction number two. Gotta love combustion. And if I take my candle over to the balloon that's blue, you can see that the flame from the candle burned a hole through the latex. It popped the balloon. I didn't use a pin. I could have. I could have just squeezed it enough to pop it and let the helium out. But I used a flame because I also wanted to test to see if contents of the balloon, when exposed to a flame, would do anything. And they didn't. Pop the balloon. Big deal. Show me something I haven't already seen. All right. Um, so my other balloon is, of course, full of hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is very reactive. Hydrogen was the gas used. Why? Because Germany didn't have access to the reserves of helium that we have in the US. They used hydrogen to fill dirigibles, zeppelins, blimps, if you will. Remember the Hindenburg. If anybody's seen pictures of the Hindenburg, they're aware that the Hindenburg came into contact with something. There's still debate as to what the Hindenburg came into contact with to cause the hydrogen contained within it to start reacting. Okay, I'm going to use my flame to demonstrate my small Hindenburg. I know all the, all the techs in here are like, Ooh. Um, so take a look at my candle. What didn't happen to my candle? Okay, not only, uh-oh, the tape, did you see it? The tape that's holding the candle onto the yardstick caught on fire because my candle is a little stub at this point. In any case, so not only not only did that first balloon just pop, but the contents of that first balloon, the helium, extinguished the candle when they raced out. All those little helium atoms raced out and extinguished the candle. Whereas, whereas the hydrogen did not extinguish the candle. Okay, so my freshman year, Virginia Tech, September 13th, 1982, I was sitting in McBride 100, and my instructor, Larry Taylor, now a now retired uh, colleague and friend, did that in class. I came from a high school where we pretty much kind of had nothing. And I thought, what am I doing in this classroom that seats 560 people, or used to? 560 people, I am looking around, I'm feeling overwhelmed, what am I doing here? My parents had just left me on a Monday morning and I was terrified. And this thud interrupted my thoughts and guess what? I wasn't paying attention, I missed it. I missed it entirely. What just happened? What was that? I also missed the fact that there was a syllabus. I'd never heard that word before. And so the next time when I came in and there was a quiz, I didn't have my calculator. I didn't have anything with me. How was I supposed to know there was a quiz? I didn't read the syllabus. It was right there. Okay, I wasn't paying attention. I've made a lot of these mistakes. And because I'm not related to the students that are coming in to, you know, I, I'm not their parent, they're going to listen to me, unlike my own kids who, you know, may or may not do the same thing. All right, I have a couple more um, comments to make, and then we have time for questions. Okay, so I guess I'll preface, before I have two more pictures to show you, um, I'll preface my comments with the fact that I've been here a really long time at Virginia Tech, 
I came here in 1982. My spouse, who was a marching Virginian, he's on this recording of the marching Virginians, 1974-1984, directed by Harry Price, and uh, my spouse was a bass trombonist in the marching Virginians. He came here in 1984, transfer student from VCU. I graduated in the summer of 1986 because I took a co-ops co-op quarter and I got kind of messed up. Took me four years and a summer to graduate from Virginia Tech. My spouse came in. He wasn't my spouse at that time. This dude transferred from VCU in 1984. He should have graduated, excuse me, 83. He should have graduated in 85. Well, in 1991, he finally finished his diploma. We had married, started a family, never thought that guy was going to graduate from college, but eventually did. The path is different for everybody. The path is different for everybody. And I wanted to say that as a segue into my final two pictures. This is a view from the top of Buffalo Mountain in Floyd, Virginia. On January 1st, 2020, I went on a hike with my daughter and my spouse, and we hiked to the top of the buffalo. It's an, inter it's, it's an easy hike. It was cold and barren in a winter kind of way, and it was gorgeous. Take a look at that. This view is almost a 360 degree view. I don't even know in what direction I'm looking in this picture, but it was the quintessential, I've hiked to the top of a mountain and I've gotten my reward. Look at that view. The clouds were even spectacular. It was perfect. Look at the shadows of the clouds on the landscape. Look at how the chemistry of the atmosphere changes the view the further away you're looking. It looks blue out there. Why is it blue? No, those are the Blue Ridge Mountains. Why? Because the atmosphere and the foliage and the plant life in the Blue Ridge Mountains conspires to make that blue tint. It was Blue Ridge Mountain perfection. Floyd, Virginia. First time I'd ever hiked that. Wow. And then, this is another local, very popular hiking destination, local to Virginia Tech. This is McAfee Knob. Much more difficult hike. It's about four miles and a lot of it is straight up and it's rocky. And I struggled a little bit, I'm kind of old. I went on this hike on March 15th, 2020 with my son who is currently a Roanoke College student. Hey, he, he's the, the keeper in the, in the goal, okay? So, hey, let's go on a hike. This is before all the parking lots on the AT were closed because too many people hiking already and we needed to back off from that. Well, on this particular day, this was a Sunday morning, we hiked up. I have been to McAfee Knob one time prior. This was my second time up. It was cool and damp, but we were sweating. And the entire time up, I was thinking to myself, wow, I hope that the sun burns off the fog before we get to the top. And then as we neared the top, I thought, hmm, I hope the sun comes out today to burn off the fog before we get to the top. But we got to the top, and guess what we saw? We saw nothing. Not anything but cloud cover. Visibility was down to about 15, 20 feet. And then it was like nothing. Well, so that might have been a failed hike. 
I get to the top, I've worked hard, where's my reward? Nothing. My daughter, my older daughter, went to Bali, to Bali, excuse me, went to Bali with some friends after she graduated from Virginia Tech. They hiked to the top of a mountain to see a sunrise. Guess what? They went all the way to Bali, and this is what they saw at the top of the mountain they hiked to and paid dearly to be at that place at that time. And it seemed as if nature was conspiring against them and nature may have been conspiring against us. But I tell you what, not very many people get to stand on McAfee Knob and have in front of them an abyss of fog. It was amazing. My point in showing you both that view and that view is that right now things are different. Your journey to college looks different now, radically different now, than it did a few short months ago. Who'd have thought? My point is that you can get from the experience that is going to be presented to you absolutely as much as you decide to take away from the experience. Do not think that the experience you're about to have is lesser. It is different. It is going to prepare you for life in the future. And I didn't take these pictures with this intent in mind, but as I looked through my pictures just last night, I said these two have to go in to tomorrow's PowerPoint, which wasn't yet quite finished. But at this time, we've got some questions coming in. And I'm happy to entertain those. What interested me in teaching chemistry? Wow. Um, teaching seems fun and teachers get their summers off. Anybody ever heard that before? <laughs> so, um, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in chemistry having no clue as to what I might do in the future. No clue. And I didn't have any guidance from home or from any advisors here on campus, I might add, to, to, to prompt me to think about why I was spending time studying chemistry here at Virginia Tech. I just knew that doing college was something that as a result you were likely to do better in life. That was as concrete as my guidance for college had been. Neither of my parents went to college. We had no clue. We, we collectively, as a group, had no clue. But we should go. You should go. You should go. You're a bright young lady. You should go. Um, and I saw a lot of bad teaching, and I thought I could do it better, honestly. I started my career with 10 years spent constructing pyrotechnics for the chemistry department. So I was a little lab rat for a long time. And I saw a lot of bad teaching happening. Boring. People falling asleep in lecture halls. That happens. Um, I started by teaching high school chemistry at Northside High School and Cave Spring High School in Roanoke while I was taking my graduate classes to earn my PhD, which eventually led me into the college classroom. And, and no regrets. Oh my goodness. I found my passion. I didn't know what it was, but I found it by working really hard. And then, from my experience, what is the best way for a student to build a relationship with a professor? Well, um, sometimes students think that you need to go meet the professor after the first class. Now, we're not going to be shaking hands any longer, and we're not going to be in the same room. But the, that's not the way to build a relationship. The way to build a relationship is to take the scenario that I present to you. I'm your teacher. Here's what the class involves. And you actively pursue all of the goals I've set forth in my syllabus. And along the way, when you're confused, you ask me questions. And along the way, when you have something insightful to say, you make sure I know it. And you send me an email. Hey, the other day when we were talking about this thing, there was this thing. And then when I give you an assignment, you actively seize it. And you think about it. And you turn in to me to read something that came from you.
and you share with me, short story, one of my former students, 2006-2007 school year, young man came, comes to see me in the fall semester and he's pissed and he says, Dr. Edelton, actually I wasn't a PhD at that point, Mrs. Edelton, actually I go by Janine because that's my name, um, Janine, can we have an appointment? Yes. So we sat down and he was so upset. He said, I have a C in your class. I don't want a C in your class. This guy's a business major, BIT. And he says, he was taking my pathways class. And he says, I have a C and I'm mad because I'm smarter than that. But guess what? I'm not Greek. I'm not a member of a frat. I don't have girls who are members of sororities. I don't have all the coofers. Koofers with a K, K-O-O-F-E-R-S. I don't have access to the Koofers. And so I'm not doing as well, you know, per the grade book. He said, but here's the deal. I think that's unfair. Here's what I want from you. I would like to know if you would provide me with all of your old tests. Because guess what? I'm going to put them online. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to put them online. If you give them to me voluntarily, then, then I'm just going to put them online. And I said, guess what, young man, I'm not going to tell you his name, I didn't ask his permission to tell his story right now, but I said, yeah, here, gave him a big stack of paper. He put them online. He and his buddies from Lee Hall in the Pamplin College of Business put them online. Not just me, they asked all of their instructors that semester, can we have all of your old tests? Yes, you can. We didn't care. Gave them our old tests. They put them online. It's called Koofers.com. And they were purchased by Mr. Zuckerberg back in, oh, I don't know, 2010, 2011, something like that. So they started out struggling a little bit. That dude then, Dr. Filer mentioned the Sporn Award. When I was nominated for the Sporn Award, that's only the beginning of the work for the nominee. You have to put together a package of evidence that says, yes, I deserve this award. And I contacted all kinds of old students. And that dude, Koofers.com guy, was one of them. And I said, could you write me a letter of recommendation? And he did, among other students that, that did that for me. My point being with relationship building, be yourself establish relationships that are real to you that you don't have to fake and you're going to be just fine if you are actively engaging in you know maybe it's not me maybe it's some other thing some other class maybe it's theater maybe it's design appreciation with Greg too I don't know establish relationships that are authentic and they will take care of you as you move along your path how can I be successful online same thing Something like a chem lab, go, don't miss it. When things are due, turn them in. When it's time to do an online lab, do it. Okay? Because the reasons why people don't succeed in college have nothing to do with how smart they are, but that they don't pay attention, they miss deadlines, they miss the start of the Zoom session, they miss the question asking, help review sessions, they don't pay attention and they fail to show up. That's how people fail to succeed at college, at any endeavor. Um, what is a hybrid class going to look like? A hybrid class is going to involve you actively engaging live and synchronously with your instructor on Zoom. And I'm going to be staring at a camera like I'm staring right now. It's going to be the camera on my laptop. And I'm going to be staring you down. And we're going to go at it just like we would. We can't be face to face. But I can put you in groups easier on Zoom than I can in a big classroom like I'm in right now. And I can pull you back. And you can have secluded time instead of time in a room with 400 people that are all trying to talk at the same time. Zoom is amazing. But choose to engage. And when you suffer either hardware, software, expertise kind of issues, seek help immediately, immediately. We have a for help desk. 
um, make sure you can engage. So the hardware thing, we had a little hardware kind of emergency right before this session, and we fixed it, okay, because we have some experts here. I didn't know what I was doing, but, but choose to engage. The strategy is not different. You are not getting less, you are getting different. And frankly, incoming students are more apt to participate online and I'm telling you that because I go into my large lecture classrooms to deliver things live and guess what my students choose to engage in instead online activities they thwart what I'm trying to do live by engaging with their electronic devices during my live class yep your kid did that too it happens so choose to engage hybrid classes are amazing. Pay attention to Canvas. Am I out of time? Is there another question? There was one that... What if you fail a test and you will fail repeatedly with dignity and your self-respect intact? Don't go to dark places because you need a test grade. I will haul you to honor court if I need to, if I think you're actively thwarting the honor code on which our university operates, and that is in direct conflict with our motto of ut prosim, and you're not being a good human. Fail with dignity and respect and then fix it. You failed because you chose that's not always the case, but 90% of the time you chose to actively engage in activities that weren't directly related to your success on my test. You chose to spend your time doing other things that may very well be productive for you. When I was an undergraduate at Virginia Tech, I spent all of my spare time at South Main Cafe. It's now called Cabo Fish Taco in Blacksburg. Why? Because that's where the bands were. Okay? And if there was a band there, I was there. It's true. I spent far too much time at South Main Cafe. No regrets. Did I graduate with a 4-0? What do you guys think? I did not. Did I graduate with a 3-5? I did not. Did I graduate with a 3-0? I did not. Had I devoted more effort to my academics, I would have had better grades. But you know what? I graduated with a 2-8. That's right around... That's fair. That's fair. Was I going to get into med school? What's med school? I didn't even know what that was, right? So do you want to go to med school? Then, then do more studying. What if you fail a test? Fix what you did wrong. I guarantee you that there are at least one or two easy fixes before you get to the more difficult fixes, the finesse fixes to get that 4-0, whatever that is. I think I'm done here. It's 11.58. Here comes Dr. Filer. Thank you, Janine. Sure. And we are so excited that you're going to be joining us in August. Um, there, you're going to experience many different faculty who have many different styles of teaching, but all of our faculty want you to be successful in your endeavors as a partnership between a professor and students as they learn together and really challenge one another to think about their next steps, to think about their passion, and to think about how they're going to work together and through hard work be successful. Um, one other thing I'm going to mention on both Wednesday and Friday, um, we have a Q&A session with a panel of faculty from many different disciplines. Um, and you can ask some of these similar questions of faculty from different spaces. So for example, the hybrid question. When you are in a hybrid class in a large environment, Environment, like chemistry, it's going to look very different than hybrid classes in, very, in much smaller classes, let's say in some seminar-based classes. So that gives you an opportunity to ask of very different faculty from very different disciplines what their class is going to be like and their advice. So I hope you'll join us. But um, we are, again, so excited you're joining us in August. And go Hokies! <laughs>